all about your reproductive anatomy and what you should know. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I am talking all about your reproductive health. And this is National Infertility Awareness Week. So we really wanna answer some of your questions. And one thing that surprises me so much is how often I sit across from people who don't understand the basics of their reproductive system. And it's not their fault or your fault, it's that we were never taught. And so that is why this entire channel exists to help educate you about your body so that you can have the information you need to make the decisions that are right for you. And I'm answering your questions that you asked right here on YouTube. And that's what this question is all about. So subscribe and follow along the channel if you wanna support this mission to help educate more people about their body, hormone, health, fertility. So we're gonna dive into these questions now. Can you talk about a septated uterus? My husband and I have been TTC for a while now, and I got an HSG a few months ago that showed I have a septate uterus. After discussing with my doc, she wasn't concerned at all. Her words were, I've been looking at your uterus for four years now. I would have seen it if I thought it was an issue. Could this possibly be the reason my husband and I haven't been able to conceive? So this is really interesting because the truth is, number one, well, what is a septate uterus? And then two, how do you diagnose it? And three, is it a problem? So number one, a septate uterus is a birth defect. Your uterus actually forms as two little buds of cells inside your body. And then these buds elongate and then fuse together. And this becomes the upper one third of the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. The lower third of the vagina is a different embryological origin and the ovaries are a different origin as well. Once these two buds fuse together, this midline septum is going to reabsorb. And that then allows us to have that central uterine cavity, which we think about. Now, a uterine septum is failure of reabsorption. You can actually have failure along all these different steps, so the buds may not develop at all. You might have only one develop. You might have failure of fusion. And different defects along this pathway will cause different Mullerian abnormalities, which means uterine abnormalities, because these are considered your Mullerian duct. A septum is the most common and it's failure of this very last step. Now, an HSG test is an x-ray test. And with this test, a speculum goes in the vagina and dye goes into the uterine cavity and you take x-ray pictures and you're seeing the inside of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. What's difficult about an HSG is that it cannot differentiate between the two most common uterine abnormalities, a septum and a bicornuate uterus. In a septum, you have complete fusion, just failure of that midline reabsorption. In a bicornuate, you did not have complete fusion. So you had failure of fusion, and then therefore there was nothing else to resect. So the bicornuate is a true heart-shaped uterus, whereas in the uterine septum, you have a normal external surface to the uterus and just the septum. The main difference here and why it's important to get the diagnosis is because what does it mean? In a bicornuate uterus, you've got good muscular blood supply all around, and so the placenta can still implant. And even though you do have some pregnancy complications, like an increased risk of a breach presentation and a C-section and preterm birth and labor abnormalities, you don't see quite the issue that we have with the septum, which is a really high miscarriage rate. So the miscarriage rate with the uterine septum can be up to 80%. And after you go and respect the septum, you can normalize the uterine cavity. And now that miscarriage rate is dropping back down to your age-related norm. There's nothing to resect in a bicornuate. So there's no surgery to be done. Classically, we are trained that a uterine septum does not cause infertility. However, I'd argue this just by saying, I see such a higher incidence of septums and in my infertility patients and that it makes sense that if the problem is this avascularity is causing miscarriages when that placenta is going to implant, that is also going to be a problem with some embryos not implanting at all. So I honestly believe they do cause both, and if you find a septum, you should get rid of it. And the comment about that this would have been diagnosed because your doctor's been seeing your uterus for four years. Well, it's not always diagnosable on a vaginal ultrasound. So on a vaginal ultrasound, the uterus is a potential space, meaning you can totally have that septum on the inside, but because the uterus is not filled with that liquid, you don't see it. 
And this is not something you would see on a speculum exam or that you would feel on a biomanual exam. So unless you're doing the test to go and look for it, which is an HSG or a saline sonogram or an MRI, you may not get the diagnosis. In this circumstance, I would recommend either an MRI or a saline sonogram in the office so that we can distinguish between a septum and a bicornuate. And if you had a septum and were my patient, I would recommend that we remove it. That way we can hopefully not have a higher chance of miscarriage, but also if it is causing or contributing to your fertility, at least that is helping improve your odds. All right, thanks for doing these videos. I had a DNC 10 weeks ago for a missed miscarriage of 14 weeks pregnancy, and my period still hasn't come back. My OBGYN said that it could take up to four months for it to come back. Is that the guideline you use before checking for Asherman syndrome? What testing do you do to check for that? So Asherman syndrome is where scar tissue replaces the normal uterine lining. We see this as a complication after uterine infection, postpartum hemorrhage, or DNC when you're further along. It's not very common after just a routine DNC. But at 14 weeks, the pregnancy is definitely more advanced and the placenta is more densely adherent into that uterine cavity. And that's when the risks start to rise. Asherman is defined by the scar tissue. And when you have it, you don't have periods because of the amenorrhea. Now, in the big picture, the further along you were in the pregnancy, the longer it might take for your next period to come because those HCG hormones have to drop before your body will start ovulating. And so where you are now is, is it Asherman? Is it just anovulation? What could be going on? I don't have a magic number of waiting four months. Honestly, I usually say like two period cycles. So by that eight week mark, if you've not had a bleed again, especially if you previously had regular cyclic periods, my alarm bells are going off a little bit. And I would want to bring you in for a vaginal ultrasound, see what's happening. Does it look like your lining's growing? Are you about to ovulate? Check blood work if it's uncertain. And if nothing is happening, your ovaries are quiet, your lining is thin, I can't tell, that's a place where a saline sonogram, again, where we put saline or water into the uterine cavity and expand that cavity is going to help answer the question for us. Asherman can be surgically resected. I have a very specific protocol afterward that I believe in to try to help facilitate uterine healing instead of just scar replacing scar. The more dense the adhesion, the more surgeries it's going to take, the longer it's been there, the harder it is, and sometimes it's never healed. When we hear cases of how abortion laws are resulting in people having infertility, this is the prime example why. Somebody had to carry a pregnancy later or have a bad uterine infection or heavy bleeding after a premature rupture of membranes, medically could not intervene, ended up very sick, and that infection causes some of the worst scarring you can imagine inside the uterus. And so we are seeing people develop this very terrible Asherman syndrome that we can't fix because of what they went through. So just to gain context, that is something that we like to diagnose earlier to try to do surgery and help, but sometimes it's something that we cannot fix and can be a more permanent cause of infertility where you would have to go through IVF and make embryos and then have a gestational carrier or another person carry the pregnancy for you. What is your experience with a unicorn uterus? I've been trying to conceive for a year and seven months and had a chemical pregnancy in February. My HSG shows my left tube is open, all levels are normal, endometrial biopsy came back normal. Husband's sperm is good, and we're moving on to IUI, but couldn't try this month since I ovulated on the right, and so waiting till next month. Trying to stay positive, but not sure why I'm not getting pregnant besides my uterus shape being an issue. A unicorn at uterus is back to those malarian birth defects. It's when only one side formed. So you only have this central uterine canal. It is more tubular in shape, and you have one fallopian tube. You still have two ovaries, and so even though I still let patients, when they ovulate on the other side, attempt pregnancy, because remember the fallopian tube is like that little blow-up inflatable thing outside the car lot, it moves around. So that fallopian tube is going to move around to wherever the egg is. So I wouldn't set that month out. I would definitely keep trying. It's harder. Patients with a unicorn uterus have lower pregnancy rates. The uterus is shaped differently. It's harder for a placenta to implant. Now, it's not impossible. But I will say that because your uterus is more abnormally shaped and there's a higher risk of miscarriage, more of my patients with a unicornate uterus are going on to IVF sooner so that we can find that normal embryo 
we can really get a thicker lining developing by the protocols and we can put that embryo in that we know has a lower chance of miscarriage. The other thing about a unicorn uterus is that these birth defects have higher associations with kidney abnormalities and then also endometriosis. So very important to just think about the full picture here, especially if you already have this infertility diagnosis by the length of time you've been trying. So the uterine shape alone isn't going to be fixed by IUI or ovulation induction when everything else is normal. So this is a place where I would be advancing care. IUI alone, if, you're, if the sperm is good, is not going to improve your pregnancy rates. Ovulation induction and IUI, to me, isn't something I would offer because if you got pregnant with two babies in that one half of a uterus, much higher chance you're gonna lose them both. So strong recommendation at this point to really talk to your doctor about IVF and how that might be able to help you. Hello, thank you for your videos. I have some questions. Both my tubes are closed. The left tube is open only 5%. Fertility doctor recommends IVF. My OBGYN said I can try laparoscopy with chromatobation. What can I do in my situation? I am 38, other analysis look normal. Two ways to look at the world. Laparoscopy with chromatobation is putting the dye through the tubes while you watch with your eyeballs to see if it really comes out. Because an HSG test is a screening test only. The gold standard is gonna be looking at surgery. So your OB is trying to get you a better diagnosis. They're not trying to fix a tube, but sometimes a tube could spasm or x-rays aren't perfect. Now, if that's worth doing or not, depends on the full picture. Being 38 with completely normal other analysis depends on how long you've been trying and how many kids you want. Because the longer you've been trying, or if you would like to have more than one child or additional children, then the odds of conceiving start to go down with everything looking normal and falling into this category. With one tube at 5% and the other tube closed, to me, I'm strongly worried there is something going on in your body, some scar tissue or inflammatory process that is impacting the tubal function. So that even if they're open at chromatubation after this result, do I believe it? Top of list is going to be endometriosis or other inflammatory diseases. In that setting, we know that advancing care to IVF when we're worried about tubal function is 100% the recommendation. And if we lived in a world where all fertility treatments were covered, then that's absolutely what we would do. Certainly trying to get to the bottom of, do you have any inflammatory diseases or autoimmune diseases? Do you have any signs or symptoms of endometriosis? Answering those questions can be really important in getting to the root of what you want to do and then having honest discussions with your partner about your goals making sure your doctor knows how many kids you want, how long you've been trying, because the worst thing we can do at age 38 is spend more time in the diagnostic zone and not getting you into treatment no matter what we're doing. All right, friends, I hope this video helped answer a few of your questions. Going to be doing some more Q&As coming up, so ask your questions away because my entire goal and why this channel exists is so that you can understand your body better. As always, appreciate you. Please subscribe. You can listen along on the As a Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD for more information. Thanks, friends.